Income Tax 2021-2022 Other Income Part 2 Get ready to get refunds to the max diving into Income Tax 2021-2022 Tax Formula Line 1 Income This is the first page of the Form 1040 focused on line number 8 Other Income from Schedule 1 Here is Schedule 1 focused on line number 8 and we're going through some of the items that are included in the subcategories for line number eight. The total for schedule one, part one, then flowing back up to the form 1040, page one, line number eight. Scrolling back down, we're now going to the jury duty pay. So if you served jury duty, you may have received pay from the court for your time. So obviously, oftentimes, this isn't a very large or significant amount. But we want to make sure that we're reporting the jury duty and part of the reporting process is to make sure that we're reporting everything we need to so that our documentation lines up with the documentation that's in the IRS system because anything that we don't report that doesn't line up with what it should in, in accordance with the documentation on the IRS's side could kind of delay the processing of the return as it needs a, like an actual person to kind of figure out what the differences and discrepancies may be. So you may also have incurred expenses to perform your civic duty, which the court may have reimbursed you for. This also counts as income. How you handle jury duty pay and expenses can depend on your employment and the expenses you incurred to attend jury duty. Prizes and awards. So this is another one that doesn't come up all the time, but you might have prizes and awards that you would have to deal with enterprises and awards but see the instructions for line 8i so you can go into more detail uh, with regards to prizes and how exactly you would need to report them in specialized type of cases where you might have those kind of things olympic and para, uh, paralympic medals and usoc prize money you could take a look at those specialized categories to find more detail on them you can go to the irs uh, website look for the 1040 instructions uh, activity to engage in for profit income in other words you might get some income and you might get documentation for some income for example a 1099 of some kind for something that would look kind of like a business maybe but it's not actually a business for you you're doing it basically for fun as in essence a hobby that is generating some income but you're doing it principally not for income generation but as a hobby if that's the case, then instead of reporting something on the Schedule C and having to deal with possibly Social Security and Medicare and also having to deal with possibly having a loss, which could be beneficial for taxes, but something the IRS is going to be skeptical of, you record it as a hobby, in which case you might have to report the income in the other line item. The benefit of that is that if it's not an actual business engaged for profit and you're going to have income related to it, then you would like to say, I'm not going to be paying self-employment tax, Social Security and Medicare, which you would if you recorded it on the Schedule C. So you would actually benefit from recording it basically as hobby income and just paying the federal income taxes on it. However, if, it's, if it was a business, then you probably have business expenses as well. And if you have expenses, those could be deductible, reducing the amount of income uh, that you would be would you would be paying possibly even having a loss so a lot of times people are going to have a question as to whether something is a hobby or not classic examples or something like horse racing for example is always a a class example that there's court cases on and things like that because oftentimes it's an expensive hobby where you could have winnings related to it but you also could have substantial losses and if you get into this in more detail in terms of what you have to prove in order for something to be a business versus a hobby, in other words, if you're in a business that's running substantial losses year over year, then the IRS is going to start to take the position possibly after three years of substantial losses or more that that you really are dealing with something that's a hobby. And the, the emphasis on being able to prove that it's a business becomes more reliant on you as opposed to the other way around the IRS having to prove that what you're doing is a hobby. So if you're doing something that's running losses, in other words, you're going to have to be more careful that the IRS is going to basically classify it as a hobby as opposed to a business because you might be getting tax benefits from taking losses on what you're claiming as a business. Uh, if, on the other hand, you just got some random income and you have no expenses related to it, you would rather record it as a hobby income 
as opposed to business income, because if it was business income and you didn't have a loss, but you just recorded the income, you could be subject to self-employment tax, Social Security and Medicare, as opposed to if you report it as a hobby. So generally, the IRS classifies your business as a hobby. It won't allow you to deduct any expenses or take any loss for it on your tax return. If you have a hobby loss expense that you could otherwise claim as a personal expense, such as the home mortgage deduction, you can claim those expenses in full. So obviously, if it, if it was something that, that you could say was a business-related item and you had part of your home for example, as part of the business related item, but it's not really a business, it's a hobby, then you could still deduct uh, the home interest, for example, on the Schedule A uh, in that case. For tax years prior to 2018, and the reason we're talking about 2018 here is because there were substantial changes made after that point in time. So prior to 2018, other expenses such as advertising, wages, insurance, premiums, depreciation, or amortization may also be usable as an miscellaneous itemized deduction subject to 2% of your adjusted gross income. However, you must have earned more total income in your hobby than the amount of all these deductions. In other words, you can't really have a loss that would be that would be a uh, su subject here. And this was kind of a confusing component as well, because if it was a hobby, then you got to report the hobby income. Uh, and then th you would only get the itemized deductions possibly if you were itemizing and then they would be on the Schedule A and then they would would have been under this 2 percent of adjusted gross income. So they had this kind of uh, this kind of uh, percent requirement that was in place and you couldn't have more of the deductions than the income so it was a bit of a confusing uh, situation so anyways including your personal deductions so in that scenario it's likely the irs would categorize your hobby as a business anyway so uh, beginning in 2018 miscellaneous itemized deductions are no longer deductible and therefore no hobby expense is able to reduce hobby income so in other words you might have people kind of thinking about the old rule. They're saying, well, this is a hobby. I should have itemized deductions. I should have these miscellaneous deductions here, but they took that away in 2018. So you don't have that at this point in time. So if it is classified as a hobby, then you're not gonna be able to take any deductions uh, for it, like, you know, in the similar fashion as you did in the past. So stock options. Enter on line 8J any income from the exercise of stock options not otherwise reported on form 1040 or 1040SR line 1. So stock options are, are kind of a form of compensation. Oftentimes they might be included in the documentation. Say, say it was stock option, you know, that would be included in line 1 if it was something through like your work or something like that. If not, then you, this would be the default where you'd have to report it otherwise, more of an unusual kind of line item oftentimes. Income from the rental or personal property, if you engaged in the rental for profit, but were not in the business of renting such property. So if you have more detail on that one, you can also see the instructions for, for line uh, 24B. We'll take a, you can take a look at that on the instructions for the form 1040. So notice in rental property, if you're talking about rental property in general, then you might have the Schedule E instructions, and we'll talk more about a Schedule E uh, in future presentations possibly as well. Olympic and Paralympic medals and USOC prize money, the value of Olympic and Paralympic medals and the amount of United States Olympic uh, Committee, the USOC prize money you receive on account of your participation in the Olympic or Paralympic Games may be non-taxable. So not, so not income, in other words, a non-taxable amount. These amounts should be reported to you in box three of form 1099 miscellaneous to see if these amounts are non-taxable. First figure your adjusted gross income, including the amount for your medals and prize money. If your adjusted gross income is not more than 1500000 if married filing separately, these amounts are non-taxable and you should include the amount on box three of form 10, 1099 miscellaneous online 8 I then subtract it by including it on line 24C. So that's more of an unusual kind of situation, but 
if you have that come up, then hopefully, again, the software will probably be guiding you and helping you out in that instance as well. So other income, use line 8Z to report any taxable income not reported elsewhere on your return or other schedules. So all these other items, if you see, if you still see something and you say it's income, and remember the IRS sees everything as income unless they state otherwise. So if you're saying, hey, I've, I've found $100 on the ground, I don't see any anything saying I shouldn't report that. Right? The IRS doesn't know about it. So, but you know, because there's no 1099 that they got or anything like that. But maybe I need to report it as income. So, so you might put that as other income down here. You don't want to put it as a Schedule C income or anything like that, because then you might be subject to Social Security and Medicare on it. So you can list it here. List the type and amount of income. If necessary, include a statement showing the required information. For more details, see miscellaneous income in publication 525. Reimbursements or other amounts received for items deducted in an earlier year, such as medical expenses, real estate taxes, general sales tax, or home mortgage interest. See recoveries in publication 525 for details on how to figure the amount to report. You can find that on the IRS website, that publication. Amounts deemed to be income from health savings account, HSA, uh, because you didn't remain an eligible individual during the testing period. You can see form 8889 part three for that and Reemployment Trade Adjustment uh, as Assistance, RTAA payments. These payments should be shown in box five of form 1099G. So if you get a 1099G box five, then you know that, that'll give you some indication in the documentation, hopefully helping to guide you to the proper location. Other income, loss on certain corrective distributions of excess deferrals, see retirement plan contributions in publication 525, dividends on insurance policies if they exceed the total of all net premiums you paid for the contract, recapture of a charitable contribution deduction related to the contribution of a fractional interest in tangible personal property. You can see fractional interest in tangible personal property in publication 526, interest in an additional 10% penalty applied to the amount of the recapture, recapture of a charitable contribution deduction if the charitable organization disposes of the donated property within three years of the contributions. See recapture if no exception use in publication 526. Taxable part of disaster relief payments, see publication 525 to figure the taxable part, if any, if any of your disaster relief payment is taxable, attach a statement showing the total payment received and how to figure the taxable part. That could be applicable depending on the area that you're doing taxes in. So if you're in an area that was affected by a disaster, you might want to <laughs> research that a bit more. Otherwise, it's probably a, more of an unusual thing to be picking up. Taxable distributions from a Coverdell Education uh, Savings Account, the ESA, or a Qualified Tuition Program, the QTP. Distributions from these accounts may be taxable if A, in the case of distributions from a QTP, they are more than the qualified higher education expenses of the designated designated beneficiary in 2021, or in the case of distributions from an ESA, they are more than the qualified education expenses of the designated beneficiary in 2021. So in other words, you got the, you got the money, you're supposed to spend it in a certain way. And if you didn't, then it might be then taxable at that point in time, because you got a tax benefit from the growth of the money. And those are kind of specialized tax tools uh, in and of themselves. So, you know, we could spend a whole, you could, you could research them in and of themselves. Uh, and B, they were not included in the qualified rollover. Non-taxable distributions from these accounts don't have to be reported on Form 1040 or 1040 SR. This includes rollovers and qualified higher education expenses refunded to the student from a QTP that were re recontributed to a QTP with the same designated beneficiary generally within 60 days after the date of refund. You can see publication 970. For more information there, which you can find on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov.